Okay, let's get started here. Okay, so today we start the introduction to high, dy uh, high dynamic range photography, okay? Um, of all the photography that we've talked about, this is probably my favorite. I actually have a friend that does this professionally and I, I get a huge, uh, uh, I absolutely love looking at his, his uh, photographs. Um, I can actually show you guys some of those a little bit later. He does a lot of nature photography to where he, he does this process that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so what is high dynamic range photography? Um, in a nutshell, uh, it's photography that is able to capture um, basically a really high range of light uh, in, a in, a, in a series of multiple images. Um, if you look at the way that traditional photography works, when you take a photograph, the camera is capturing basically one, uh, either you know, one particular set of light ranges uh, in that photograph. Um, if I take an image of inside this classroom, it's gonna take an image, uh, you know, it's gonna take the appropriate image so that the lighting is, uh, is correct. But if you look in that image, let's say this window here is in our image, you're not gonna be able to see the difference between uh, the outside and the inside in terms of, of, of the light. So the reason why we have high dynamic range photography is to, base, is to basically mimic what you can see with your eyes. So with your eyes, if you transition from looking outside and inside and you look under the desk and all the different, sh you know, the shadows and the different lighting inside of a building and outside of the building, your brain and your eyes can, can differentiate between those two and, uh, and go back and forth, you know, pr you know, seamlessly. There's no, you know, there's no, uh, there's no camera basically trying to, to do the thinking. So your brain and your eyes, uh, can process these types of image, but a camera technically cannot. But you can through a, you know, creating a series of different uh, images, okay? So let's see, high dynamic range photography is a set of techniques that allow a greater dynamic range of luminances between the lightest and the darkest areas of an image, okay? So an example of that is uh, over here on the right is going to be the traditional photograph, just taking with your camera and the image on the left uh, is high dynamic range photography. Okay, here's an example right here of a high dynamic range uh, image. So why, why do we do this? Why do we create a high di or HDR imagery? I'm just gonna say HDR the rest of the class because I said I don't wanna say high dynamic range too much. Uh, so why do we create HDR imagery? To, uh, so the reason why we do this is to more accurately represent the wide range of light intensity levels found in real scenes. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, your eyes can compute this and your brains can uh, see these different ranges of light, uh, but a camera cannot. Uh, so an easy way to actually comprehend this and this little test everybody can do if you have a, if you have a camera phone. Um, so for example, your eyes, let's say you look underneath these desks and you see, uh, you, know, you can see all the different ranges of lights. But if I pull out my camera, and I always do this little, this little demonstration, let's say I take an image of this area without adjusting the exposure whatsoever. Well, if I take that image, uh, you can actually see it pretty well, okay? You can see the lighting, you can actually, you know, the shadowing underneath the desk, know is, is pretty good for the most part but if I take that same photograph I'm just going to step back a little bit and I focus the exposure um, on the inside so I'm going to tap my screen if you don't know this when you tap your screen on an iPhone and actually focuses the exposure on what it is that you're uh, taking a photo of if I tap for example on on we'll say someplace other than outside and I take that photograph notice that you have a really nice range of light here on the inside of the uh, of the room, but the outside is really washed out. So it's focusing that, let me come over here so you guys can see that. It's focusing that exposure on the inside. So you have really nice lighting on the inside, but the outside is really washed out, okay? So if you take that exact same photograph and you actually focus on the outside, you're gonna have a complete opposite effect, okay? So let's see. Photographs. So this time, if I actually focus on what's going on outside, you'll notice that the rest of the room 
gets really dark. You actually lose lighting contrast in you know inside the room. So uh, partially, so what HDR does in a nutshell is it allows you to be able to have really accurate contrast in your darkest areas of your scene uh, and also have the same thing in the lightest areas of your scene. So how you actually get that is by taking a series of photographs, uh, one at, uh, or usually in odd numbers, that at a minimum of three photographs, you can even do it in five, seven, and more, but typically it's done in three. So you would take an underexposed photograph, a normally exposed photograph, and an overexposed photograph, okay? So when you combine these, that allows you to, uh, using certain software, it allows you to uh, be able to grab those different ranges of light inside that photograph and actually uh, blends them together so that the areas really far in your scene have really nice range in, in tones and contrast and exposure, and the areas really close in your scene also have the same thing. So unfortunately, in traditional photography, uh, it's really hard to capture both of those with a single photograph. Can that be done handheld, or do you, is it better to, is it obviously better to have it in your fixed camera? We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about you know how you actually obtain uh, images like this. So uh, why do you do this? As I mentioned earlier, is to mimic how a human eye actually sees a scene instead of uh, how a camera does. Okay. So why? The second reason is in terms is is for rendering, is which is how will we actually use this later on in the semester. But um, HDR imagery, if done correctly, is phenomenal actually to provide backgrounds and imagery for a rendering that adjusts to different light conditions, cameras, exposures, etc. So when you do like a really good rendering in a, in a software like V-Ray for example, um, well V-Ray actually renders in a, in a high dynamic range. So it, it's not, it's not, you don't necessarily pick uh, how kind of a, you know, a photograph is taken. You don't necessarily, you don't have that liberty when you're creating uh, a rendering. So if you have a high dynamic range photograph, you can actually, it actually blends in with, uh, you know, when you actually combine a background image and a rendering that you did, they actually blend really seamlessly together so that they look real. So a lot of times when you create a really good rendering, uh, they're, they're, they're created in a sense that they're using that kind of technology, okay? Because you don't want to show someone a conceptual image of a building that has you know, a really washed out uh, background um, versus a really high and dynamic, um, you know, foreground. Quick question? Uh, I just need to do oh, okay. Can I, can you come back in a little bit? Uh, Maybe half an hour? Okay. Let's see, what time is it now? Uh, is it, am I just signing something or do I have just to sign. fill anything out? Okay. Is it for this class or is it for my other class? Oh, that's for my other class. That's right. That's right. I remember you coming and talking. Sorry. Pause for one quick sec. Sorry. It's okay. Do you have a pen? Um, yes, right here. And with the answer, you can just write that I've been in class. Uh, Wait, what'd you say, Wes? Uh, the dean said that I've been oh. to a class. Okay, so that's the second side of uh, HDR photography is for use and rendering purposes. So we'll talk about this a little bit more once we actually get to doing that. But we have the uh, photography side and then also kind of the rendering artificial side. And today we're gonna look at examples of kind of the um, uh, realistic HDR imagery versus kind of artificial and artistic versions of HDR imagery. Uh, so how does this all work? Well, this leads us into a discussion uh, about tone mapping. And this is another one of those things that's uh, a lot easier to describe when you actually are doing it versus kind of throwing it together in a series of words. But So what is tone mapping? Tone mapping overall reduces the overall contrast to facilitate the display of HDR images on a, uh, a device with lower dynamic range, okay? This can be applied to produce images which preserved, or when preserved, uh, or exaggerated local contrast for an artistic effect. So 
Um, it's more of in a in a in one sentence. It's the process of creating uh, HDR imagery and actually um, creating the proper tones in an image to be able to get that high dynamic range. Okay, so continued. It reduces the it reduces the dynamic range or contrast ratio of the entire image while retaining the localized contrast. So if we look at this image right here, uh, you know, let's talk about what exactly makes this an HDR image. Well, if you took this image in, in real life, uh, let's just say you're standing on a bridge, okay? And you're actually looking out at these buildings. Well, you're gonna focus on something, you're usually focused on something. So let's say you're actually taking a picture of this image or of this of these buildings right here where your focus is on uh, on the buildings here well typically you're going to have a really nice high range of light and contrast on that area but you're going to have a lot less of that here in the foreground and you're going to have a lot less of that in the far background okay or vice versa if you're focusing on this boat you typically have a lower amount of contrast uh, and light in the other portions of the image so by by creating an HDR photograph uh, it allows you to have that high range throughout the entire photograph. So, for example, if you're looking at this image, and it's, if you actually have it on your screen, it's much easier to actually see this. But if you look at, for example, the areas underneath the dock over here, a lot of where you really see it is in the darker portions of the image. But uh, if you look at the dock area on the, on the kind of the base of, of these buildings here in Venice, um, you can actually see things like the pylons and the things in the in the structure that's holding up uh, these buildings. So, and typically, you know, that would be so dark that it gets washed out. And you don't actually see it. Your 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 brain just actually renders it as kind of a dark shadow. Whereas when you have uh, a high dynamic range photograph, it actually allows you to see you know see this in every portion of the image. Okay, so you have nice deep strong contrast in you know areas like the waves and the ripples of the boat you know if you look really carefully you probably can't see it you can't see it on the projector but on the screen you can actually see the details of the boat down here uh, along with the details of the shadows uh, back here but you can also see the same thing in the sunset um, in the background of the image so you're seeing that high contrast and that high dynamic range throughout the entire photograph okay so software choices, you know, what are we going to use to to create this? Well, you're in this class to take Photoshop, so we know that's definitely one of the answers. OK, so the first choice is Photoshop, although uh, we're going to learn this in Photoshop. There actually are other, several other programs that actually do this, uh, in my opinion, better. And we'll talk about what those what those are. But Photoshop does do a really good job with it because you actually have a lot more tools on what you can do uh, other than just create the HDR image, okay? So we have Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop has a process where it merges, uh, what, or it actually automatically merges um, these HDR photographs uh, together for you. Uh, and all the software actually does that, but the process is actually uh, quite simple. But what some of these other photographs doesn't, or doesn't have is the ability to do additional uh, post-processing, okay? So typically when just creating the HDR image, it might create a really nice image, but still not done. It still requires, you know, using some of the techniques that we've already lear learned in the class. You know, things like applying different adjustment layers, uh, you know, et cetera. So things like levels and curves, those are all different, you know, ideas and how you might even continue to enhance the HDR image, okay? So Photoshop, merge to HDR out of our automated action. Uh, there's also the ability to do post-processing. Um, there is no built-in tone mapping, so there are other softwares that actually do this a little bit better. Uh, it's available on all the lab computers, and it's available for PC and Mac. So that's you know kind of some of the pluses and minuses of using Photoshop. Another one, which is probably the uh, the best software to do this in, I would say if you type in, if you go to Google and you Google HDR imagery, probably like 75% of it. Um, is actually using a pro program like this called Photoma or Photomatics, uh, which is actually specialized in doing HDR photography. Um, but if you're someone that maybe actually likes to create the artistic versions of HDR photography, which I'll show you some examples of, um, you're, you might want to use software like Photoshop where you can actually do additional editing to it other than just creating uh, the typical HDR uh, 
image, okay? The nice thing about Photomatics is that you can buy the standalone software. You can also buy a plugin for Photoshop where you can create uh, the HDR imagery, not just using Photoshop, but using the plugin. So, but it does, you know, cost a few bucks. Okay, so now we're gonna look at examples. Uh, we're gonna look at the, the first examples we're gonna look at are realistic examples of HDR imagery, okay? So we saw the one of Venice where you could kind of see the, you know, the high dynamic range of the entire photograph. So we'll look at some realistic, realistic examples and we'll also look at some artistic examples. And actually, to go back to your question, I was thinking I had a slide on this, but maybe, maybe I don't. Uh, to go back to your question about how you would do that, um, you typically, if you're gonna take an image, okay, and, I, and I, I think there should be some slides coming up here that will show this in a little bit, but if you're gonna take an image, you have to think about a couple different things. Is, is the scene that you're taking them in, so for example, are you taking photographs of a scene that has no movement in it? Because you are taking three images. If you're taking an image of something that has movement, for example, someone's walking down the street, you're gonna get that kind of, you've probably seen it, that kind of ghosted effect of someone walking uh, or you might see the ghost and effect of like a car moving. That's an example of someone taking three different images, maybe a low contrast or the, you know, three or five or seven images, but there's actually movement in your photo. So you might actually see that ghosted uh, examples, or I'm sorry, those ghosted objects in, uh, inside your photograph that are moving, okay? So you might have another type of scene where uh, maybe it's nature where things aren't moving, where it's actually quite easy to do that because uh, you don't have to worry about anything moving, but it does require either a tripod or you know, you can do it without one, but you definitely want to have a steady hand. You want the images to be as exact as possible, okay? And we'll, I'll show you some examples of kind of what those will look like here in a sec. So here are some, uh, here's, here's a couple realistic versions of what HDR photography does. So a few minutes ago, I showed you that example of taking the photograph with my phone, real basic kind of dumbed down example, but I showed you the example of what it was like taking the, the photograph inside and also focusing outside. So if you look at this example here uh, and where you actually see HDR photography used a lot is actually in architectural photography uh, and real estate photography, okay? Where they're showing, um, where they're taking photographs of spaces, okay? So typically an image up here on, the image up here on the top uh, is an example of just a basic image where you're actually focusing on the interior space, okay? Uh, you can see here that you can see like decent contrast. You can see that it has hardwood floors. You get a good idea of what's going on inside the space. But what you're actually losing is what's going on outside the space, okay? If you actually look at those windows, you really have no clue of whether or not you're, you know, are you on the first floor? Or are you on, you know, the 50th floor of a high rise? Where are you? Well, that's you know, that's, that's a part of taking, you know, in terms of real estate or, or architectural photography, that's a part of the photography is what's going on around the building. So this is actually a great example of where you might use HDR photography, okay? So the example on the bottom is an example of the same image at the top, but going through the HDR process, okay? So they took a, uh, they took a low exposure photograph, a normally exposed photograph, and a high uh, exposed photograph. And by combining those, you get something that looks like this. So you actually have a greater, uh, a greater uh, display of light and shadows on the interior space, but you also have the ability to see the same thing off in the distance, okay? So you can see that you have much better light and contrast on the ceiling tiles, on the wood flooring of all the interior spaces, but you also get the sense of, you know, this, this photograph is of a space of a high rise. So you actually can see the surrounding uh, city that surrounds it, okay? Does that start to kind of start to make sense? So here's another example right here. So this is, uh, you know, when you start to look at architectural photography, okay? Well, HDR photography is often used to be able to really capture uh, the light in a scene, okay? And that's, that's you know, that's why we, that's why we use HDR photography. But I guarantee you that the normal image did not look like this. It was not able to capture, you know, the range of light throughout the entire scene. You know, you're gonna focus on something inside this photograph when taking it, and you might have a really nice range of light in that area, but you're not going to uh, here down at the ground, 
maybe up here, and then also way up here. So by creating, by using the HDR process, it allows you to get this really nice, rich range of light throughout the entire photograph, okay? So that's a, you know, architectural example. I won't talk about all of these here, but I'll just kind of flip through them. So here's a nature scene, okay? Where you can see that you have nice, rich uh, range in light uh, in the background, but you also do in the foreground. If you look at the areas where there's shadow along the bank of the lake, you can actually very clearly see a lot of those details in that in those shadows. So that becomes where that becomes very successful, okay, when creating that photograph. Okay, so if you look at this at these uh, at the buildings uh, both in the background and in the foreground, you have a nice rich contrast of light and shadows here in the foreground and the bushes and the trees. But you have that same uh, lighting in the background. Okay. You'll notice a common theme of a lot of these is they're all kind of taken at like dusk. So it's a really popular time to take these kind of imagery or to take that uh, to create HDR imagery because you can actually see the lighting in the building. If you were to take, try to take the same image at noon, you wouldn't get the same effect because one, a lot of the lights probably wouldn't be able, wouldn't be turned on and you, the camera wouldn't be able to capture the glow of those lights because they're just not popping. So you'll notice that that's kind of a common theme of a lot of these images is, is the time of the day that they're taken. So uh, if you went and took this photograph out, uh, we'll say in DVC, if you were to use this as, as an example, uh, typically whether or not you focused on up here or you focus down here, let's say you actually focused up here and you're focusing on the materials on the outside of the building, you would likely have really dark shadows in the areas that you weren't focusing on. So areas like this. Uh, and vice versa, if you focused on the areas underneath the building, you would lose a lot of that color and contrast on the other parts of the photograph. So there's another good example of where that works quite well. Okay, so here's an example of creating an HDR image with a really high movement scene, okay? Really beautiful photograph, um, but you can start to see where some of these little errors in, in the image. Can anybody spot some of those? I get out of the way this car so you, even if you were to uh, I, I think if you got really good at taking the photographs with your camera you could probably transition between the three you know low contrast normal contrast and a high contrast you can probably transition between those pretty quickly if you practice it but you know even when you're really quick at it it's still gonna take you you know a couple seconds to take those two photo or you know those multiple photographs so you are gonna get movement so uh, here's a good example of that ghosting, okay? So you can see kind of the ghosting of that car. You can see the ghosting of that person because when they first took that image, that person might have been here. But when they last took the last image, that person might be, you know, is now has moved a couple feet. So you'd be surprised in how much actually, things actually move in a matter of just a split second. Yeah. There's actually a headless person in the center. There's a headless person here in the center. So. That's just one of the effects of creating HDR photography. And it's a very similar effect if you have like a really long exposure, or if you have, like, I'm sorry, if you have like a really long shutter speed. So if you have like a one or two second shutter speed, you might get similar effects because you're actually recording that movement, okay? But you can see here in this image here that you have really rich contrast here in the foreground, here in the buildings, at, at, at all the buildings, but also in the lighting in the background. You're not losing any of that anywhere in the image, okay? Okay, so notice the lighting that, how good the lighting here is here at the building that we're actually focusing on and actually at the cathedral in the background. It's all very rich, so this is another great example of a realistic HDR photograph. Okay. Notice that you can see uh, you can see a lot of that really rich detail underneath the rocks over here. So if you look at the shadows, you can actually see uh, you can see that contrast uh, as it starts to transition into the water, both in the foreground and in the background. Photo that obviously that was taken that was created using Photomatrix, Photomatics. Yeah. 
Okay, so we should be transitioning over to creative examples. So I'd say creative or artistic, okay? Um, so depending on what you want the overall outcome to be of the photograph, uh, you might have a couple different variations. You might have the realistic sense that it's actually, you know, somewhat believable that that's actually what the photograph actually looked like, or it's actually what it looks like in real life. That's the way that your eye actually sees it, but you can also exaggerate it to a certain extent. And I'll show you some examples, some creative examples of where a lot of that was, you know, exaggerated to get a certain look. Okay, this first example is probably. Um, still borderline or still borderline uh, you know realistic it's not too uh, it's not too fake but you can actually kind of if you look at the image carefully you start to kind of see that it's got a little bit too much pop in terms of the color throughout throughout the image well that's kind of the purpose of an HDR photograph is to do that but this is starting to become borderline um, a little uh, on the artistic or creative side Okay, and this is a lot more. Okay, so this is now where we're really pushing the lines of a more of an artistic HDR photograph. Okay, so what are some what are some traits of this photograph that start to make it a little non-believable? Yeah. Uh, surrounding the, uh, the building, there's kind of like a weird halo-y aura thing. Yeah, there is. Like you can see that all around you. There is. There's actually a little bit of kind of a, of a halo effect around the edge of the building. Okay. But my guess, if I was to um, analyze this, is that they probably edited, actually, pro I think they probably edited a lot inside this image. What are, some, what are a few more things that we noticed before I say what those things are? Yes? Really bold greenery up in the front right, front left corner. Really bold greenery? They're really dull. Oh, really okay. dull greenery? Like how bright the light is at the roof. Okay, anything else? That, yeah. That Elko. Uh, down here or over here? Uh, wood in the middle of the that this right there. Uh huh. And go up. Oh, it start. It does. It actually kind of looks like it's a little. Like twisting. It does. It does kind of look like that. I don't know if that was. I don't know if that was the intent of the photograph, but yes, that does look a little, a little fake. So some of the things that catch my attention is one, there's extreme high contrast between the colors of the material of this building. I can see that we have you know, these really dark grays and also the really light grays. Um, you know, but looking at what actually makes this HDR, if you look at, for example, kind of the detail that you get underneath the eave of this roof, well, it's really clear. You actually get the, sh the range and the shadows, but it's still, you, know, you can still understand what's going on in there. It's not so dark in shadow that you lose a lot of that materiality of what's going on there. Um, but they also have the clouds. So the clouds, it looks like the apocalypse is about to, you know, is, is about to happen. But uh, you know, if that's the overall goal of the image, it, it may, be, may be a very successful image. So I don't want to give the impression that one is right or wrong. They're all correct. They're all depending on what you're trying to get. They're all beautiful and fantastic images. But my guess is what how they got this is they created the HDR image, but they did additional post processing. So they probably used something like the burn tool, and they you know made these the clouds and the materials of the building look a little extra, you know, kind of menacing, if you will, okay? So, but if that's the overall what you're trying to get, that's, that's great, that's, it's a really successful and nice photograph, okay? So what do we see here? What's some things that start to give that away and start to push this as more of on the creative side? Yes? The face in the clouds, yeah. I, I'm gonna guess that's probably not natural. So I, I suppose it's could. It's still somewhat believable. Yeah. That could be there. You could have kind of that depression in the clouds, but I would bet there's probably some post processing that kind of enhanced that, you know, in into the imagery and probably enhanced, you know, a majority of these other clouds. But if you look at the actual, you know, what's going on in the foreground, that's kind of the just the basis of the HDR image. You have really nice rich coloring in the foreground and also in the background in the mountains. Okay. Obviously, we've all lived here long enough that we know that this probably has never existed, okay? But it's still a really cool photograph. It's still, uh, you know, it's still, it's still really rich in color, rich in details, uh, and it's, it's a really nice, cool, successful image, okay? But you can see that it definitely borderlines uh, reality.
Okay, so this is an HDR panoramic. Okay, we'll actually briefly talk about panoramic photography today, although I kind of cut down on that just because a lot of what was used to create panoramic photography in the past is not so much the case anymore. It's a lot easier to create panoramic images. Um, so you're not gonna go out there and take 80 photographs and stitch, stitch them all into photograph these days because almost all of our cameras do that by itself digitally while you're doing it. So. That's why we won't talk about that in too much detail. But this is a cool example of, a, of an HDR slash panoramic image. Okay, pretty, pretty cool stuff here. <clears throat> but you can see that this boat is, uh, you know, the coloring in the boat and the coloring of the sky is probably a little too rich to be real. Okay. If you focused on this image in real life, you would probably lose a lot of the color and the detail of the sky. You might be able to capture the blue in the boat, but I'm, I would guess that a lot of the colors uh, in this image have, have really been enhanced. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. It's probably pretty dark on, on the screen, but very nice on the screen. All right, so we're just going to briefly talk about panoramic photography, and then we will, and then we'll move on. Okay, so what is the panorama? I think we all kind of know what a panorama uh, is, and you know, kind of in a nutshell. But a panorama is any wide-angle view or representation of space. Uh, 360 degree panorama is equivalent to a full 360 uh, degree field of view. Okay, that makes sense. So 180 degree panorama would be from here to here and everything in between, whereas 360 would be taking an image all the way around. Okay, you guys have probably seen uh, this image before. Does anybody know what this is or where this is by chance? Did I hear it? I thought I heard it. It's not Paris. It's the Vatican, yeah, it's, it's actually Rome. This is actually an image that was uh, not used there was not a you know really fancy camera used when this was created. This is actually a panoramic view that was once created just by hand. Okay, so back in the old days when this was when this was done, it was actually panoramic photography was used or was created uh, involving a process called stitching. Okay, and Photoshop Photoshop can actually do this along with a variety of other software. We're not actually going to do this in Photoshop, but just to kind of give you the background of where it came from. It involved taking, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of photographs and actually stitching them together to create one larger uh, photograph. Now these days we have our phones and you put it on panoramic mode and you can do that really easily along with just about every other camera uh, that's made. Okay. So, and you can do this usually using some kind of uh, device, some kind of uh, some kind of contraption that allowed you to uh, take that photograph from one particular nodal point. Okay. So the mechanics of how uh, of how a panoramic image works. So it it starts with creating or isolating a nodal point, which is kind of if you're taking a an image like this, your body would be the nodal point of that image. You're kind of creating the starting point of where that would happen. This eliminates parallax in the final stitching image. Does anybody know what parallax is by chance? No? So parallax is, it's the effect of when you take a panoramic image, uh, when a certain item in the scene starts to appear in multiple different ways. How you get that is, let's say for example, when you're actually trying to take a panoramic image, uh, the best technique is to actually isolate yourself, not so much to do it like this, but to actually do it like this, keeping it in one place and actually rotating your body. So parallax occurs when you're actually, let's say when the first image is taken, I take it at this point, okay? It appears in one way, but when you take it at this image, that item might still be inside the image, but it's taken from a different vantage point, okay? So, and I'll show you some examples of what that actually looks like uh, in a second. You'll, you've probably seen this in an image before, and you've probably seen this when you've taken panoramics with your phone, you just didn't necessarily know what it was. Um, this eliminates parallax in the final stitching mode by keeping a, you know, a nice nodal point. Uh, to, to do this, you're gonna move your body and camera around that nodal point. 
Okay, so here's kind of a diagram on how that occurs. Okay, so what what this diagram is showing is is what I as what I just explained um, when when uh, showing about the different images in the background. Okay, so the final result is an unrolled image shown later in the act. We're actually not going to look at that. Okay, does anybody know what a QTVR movie is by chance? Has anyone ever gone on Google um, on Google Maps? Is it the 360 that they're doing like with the YouTube now? Yeah, so it's basically it's what's created using a three, 360 degree camera. So they're becoming pretty popular now. You've, there's lots of uh, cameras that you could buy that do this. But has anyone ever gone on Google Maps? and clicked on those little points that allow you to actually drag your camera around and look all the way around you. Well, that was created using a 360 degree camera. Now they have cameras that you can just kind of, uh, you know, take a picture of something, but actually takes a picture of everything around you to create those. Well, you could actually do that back in the day just through a whole different process. Now it's a lot easier. Okay, so here's some examples of some panoramic photography. Okay, so something to keep in mind when you're looking at panoramic photography is items in panoramic images that are often curved always appear as straight and vice versa as well. So items that are curved appear as straight and items that are straight always appear as curved. So using that knowledge, what would you guess that this scene actually looks like in real life? If items are straight, items that are straight in real life appear as curved in the image, and items that are curved appear straight in real life or in the image. What would we what would we get from this from this image right here? What do we think this scene looks like? Like a circular amphitheater type thing? Yep, it's exactly what it is. This is actually a panoramic of a circular amphitheater. So it's actually a 360 degree view uh, or going all the way around. It may not be 360, it might be, I'd say it's at least 180. But this actually appears as straight. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at panoramic photography and what's actually happening uh, in the scene. So that's this is uh, what you're actually seeing. That photograph is actually taken at the bottom of this area. So depending on how you take your panoramic view, you could very much convey a very different point. So uh, most people would not even think of this as anything close to that. So they're conveying a very different point. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're taking uh, panoramic photography. To a certain point, eventually you kind of lose the purpose depending on how wide that view is. So based off of what I said, what do you think this actually, with what this actually looks like in real life? Straight hallway. Yeah, it's, a it's actually a straight hallway. So it just goes like that, okay, with a couple doors in it. Now here's kind of multiple dimensions. Okay, all of these images were actually kind of used with actually that stitching process. This is kind of, a, these are all older images. Okay. I was gonna say, does anyone recognize where this is? But I realized that it says it right there at the bottom of the slide. This is actually the Amtrak station in, uh, in Oakland. Okay, so here's actually a really good example of that ghosting effect. Okay, if you look at these people, you can see that ghosting process, which could be very much desired in a lot of photography. Some people actually like it. It's not usually it doesn't usually happen by accident, and it's just like okay, that's that's just what happened. A lot of people actually desire it. Could be uh, it could be something that a lot of people actually want in a photograph. Okay, so I'm going to go through the rest of these uh, fairly quickly. Okay. And that's it. So let's take a quick break before we go into doing some of these demonstrations in Photoshop. So let's come back at 7.30. So it's 7.20 now, let's come back in 10 minutes and we'll learn how to actually create this in Photoshop.